Welcome back to Operating Systems. In today's lecture, we'll take a look at one of the most important abstractions of an operating system, processes. So let's review what we talked about last time when we looked at processes. So we said that in a very simple way, we can see a process as a program that is being executed. So it's not only the program that resides on your hard disk as a result of your compiler generating a binary file, but it is more. It contains also dynamic state. So you have to remember where in your program you're currently executing, what is the current status of your data, of your files, of your IO connections, and so on. And we've also seen that processes can uh, consist of alternating sequences of CPU bursts, so CPU bursts are sections of time where you do lots of calculations, so executing code on the CPU. And then when you need to get more data to operate on, or you need to save some data because you're running out of memory or something, then you need to perform some I.O. So this I.O. might also take some time. So this is a so-called I.O. burst. So processes to be executed require resources of the computer like CPUs, memory and I.O. devices. And we've also seen that processes have a state. So we have running processes. These are the processes that are currently executing on the CPU. So in case of a single CPU system, we only have one process at a time executing on the CPU. So process B in that case, we have ready processes. Ready processes have all the resources they need to execute whatever they want to do, except for the CPU. So whenever process B is moved from running into ready or blocked, another process from ready can be moved into running. So process C in that case. And if you execute an IO operation like process A, started to calculate something and then decided to do some IO, then you're in a blocked state. So you cannot continue with your process until yeah, your I operation has completed. And when this has completed, please note, and that's important, that you cannot return to running immediately because that would prioritize processes that do lots of short I.O., but you just move to ready. So this indicates you have all the resources again. So all your I.O. is completed except for the CPU, and then you will be scheduled eventually. So processes are conceptually considered to be independent and concurrent control flows. But of course, as we only have one CPU in the simple case, executing instructions, we have to switch between these processes to enable this illusion of concurrency. So processes are here a very important abstraction. Thus, is, uh, this is where they are under control of the operating system. And the operating system then has to perform resource allocation. So if you want to access some resources and also resource revocation. So if a process is no longer allowed to use some resources. So to look at processes in a more detailed way, we are going to look at the process model in the Unix operating system. So Unix was started as a small research project by uh, Thompson and Ritchie at Bell Labs uh, in the USA in the late 1960s. So it's a system with a long history. And uh, it was actually developed because a previous research project called Multix, which tried to prototype all the modern stuff we see in operating systems today on really large and expensive machines. This project more or less failed. Bell Labs actually got out of that project. So they stopped financing the researchers working on that project. So Thompson and Ritchie looked for something else to do. And uh, they were actually pretty much uh, interested in also doing interactive uses of computers. So what they did is they found a, a, a yeah, unused old computer, so even old by the standards of that time, sitting around in the basement and they were allowed to use it because back then computers were very expensive. So you couldn't just expect to have your own computer on your desk as a researcher, but there were a small number of computers usually distributed uh, around a large university or research facility or company. And so you had to compete for time using this computer. And if you're developing system level software, of course, well, you have to test your operating system, you have to reboot the machine. So 
such a machine is very difficult to share with other people because they would be pretty annoyed if they were just writing a long text on their terminal and somebody else would just reboot the machine and their text was gone. So version 1 was created on this ancient PDP-7 machine. It was written in assembler and the first thing they actually wanted to do is to write a game back then using vector graphics and controllers but also using real physics simulations. The people working in computer science back then were mostly from mathematics and physics so they had quite some interest in this and so they needed facilities you know to coordinate processes to save high scores and so on. So essentially they figured out oh all the stuff they're writing is actually sort of a primitive operating system and it had to be primitive because the PDP-7 only had around 8,000 words of memory. Each word had 18 bits. This is a bit unusual. Back then it was rather common to have such unusual word sizes. So uh, we only standardized to multiples of 8 in word sizes. So 8, 16, 32 something with the IBM mainframes of the 360 series that introduced these standardized word sizes in the late 1960s. So the PDP-7 was a very primitive machine. They started implementing their system in assembler, but they very soon reached the limits of that machine. And so they actually tried and succeeded to get a bigger and newer machine for, uh, bought from Bell Labs, a PDP-11. So here on the upper right side, you can see Thompson and Ritchie sitting in front of two printing terminals in the 1970s. So this was essentially a keyboard and a printer in a time before screen terminals were really common and such a machine cost upwards of fifty thousand or even a hundred thousand dollars so it was not that easy to get one. Uh, eventually they managed to get a PDP-11 and then they figured out well a PDP-11 is a different machine than a PDP-7 so uh, it's speaking a different machine language so the assembler is completely different to the assembler of the PDP-7 so they've thought like yeah, if we want to bring our operating system over to that new machine, wouldn't it make more sense to implement our operating system in something that's on a more abstract level of computation than assembler? And well, uh, back then most operating systems were written in assembler, so it was rather unusual to employ a high-level language and a compiler to do this because people were afraid, compilers weren't that good at optimizing back then, people were afraid that this would just take away too much of that bit of performance they had in these old slow computers. So a PDP-11 uh, ran at about 5 to 7 megahertz and had maybe 256 uh, kilobytes of memory. So not exactly big, that's what you can get in a $5 microcontroller today if you're lucky. So. Uh, Thompson and Ritchie already had developed another language before. This was called B. B was a descendant of yet another language that was not called A, as you would imagine, but BCPL, which was back then a hodgepodge of different approaches called the Basic Combined Programming Language, developed somewhere in the United Kingdom, if I remember correctly. And uh, they reduced this B language already on the PDP-7 to be very simple and to be able to run in this very small amount of memory, but B was an interpreted language. So something similar to what you had in Java today. So B was compiled to bytecodes and these bytecodes then were interpreted by some small assembler code routine that actually emulated this bytecode machine. And if you run Java programs today, it works pretty similar. So Java is not usually directly compiled to machine code of your CPU, but to Java virtual machine bytecodes. And these can then be interpreted, which is very slow. Or you have more modern techniques like just-in-time compilers. But back in the 1970s, they didn't have that luxury. So what they did is they tried to evolve this B language into something that would be useful for developing operating system code. And well, the successor of B is C, obviously. So C was created now as a real compiler generating machine code to enable the operating system development in a high level language. First for getting Unix to run on a PDP-11 in version 3 actually. So the first PDP-11 version was still written in assembler, but maintaining this was very difficult. And as soon as C existed, some other researchers from universities around the world actually got the idea, oh, we don't have a PDP-11, but another nice machine. So maybe we can just adapt our compiler 
and then reuse most of the operating system code because it is written in this high level language and then port Unix to our machine. And that is exactly what happens. So Unix was one of the first operating systems that was actually being able to port it, to be ported to a completely different hardware architecture. But these PDP-11 machines were pretty popular, so they were relatively cheap, they were well documented, they had good service, there were lots of software available for them even when you were not running Unix. So the manufacturer of these PDP-11s, a company called Digital Equipment or Short Deck, uh, had uh, their own operating systems obviously uh, and they provided very good documentation. Unfortunately they were bought up like in the late 1990s and uh, what is remaining of DEC is now unfortunately part of Hewlett Packard so they destroyed most of the legacy of that company. So even at NTNU we had lots of DEC systems PDP-11 so I went down to the basement to our computer museum and took some photos of what you can see here are machines that would be typical machines to run Unix on in the later 1970s, PDP-11, 40 systems. So you see we have two of them in our museum and a lot of other PDP-11 smaller and some bigger systems. So uh, Unix created some abstractions already or was able to create some abstractions because it went from assembler to using a higher level language like C to implement the operating system. So now C can be used in turn to express more abstract concepts which would be more difficult or more to, would take more time to do an assembler. So Unix grew exponentially I'd say. So uh, the original Unix versions were developed as a research project at Bell Lab and uh, the code for Unix was mostly given uh, out for free or nominal fee for copying tapes to universities and other research institutions. And as you can see here, uh, it's probably hard to read. So these research institutions actually improved Unix, had their own versions of Unix. And back then in the late 70s, early 80s, uh, AT&T, the company that Bell Labs belonged to, so the big American telephone company, actually tried to make some money out of Unix. And uh, so they started selling Unix, uh, but not as a product usually, but as a couple of yeah, bits of source code that other companies could take and actually build their own versions of Unix. Strangely, in the early 1980s, one of the biggest vendors that sold Unix systems was a company called Microsoft. Yes, that Microsoft. They had their own version of Unix called Xenix. Uh, and uh, for IBM PCs and PDP-11 machines, for example. Uh, but of course, you know, they decided to go another way. So if Microsoft had decided to go and stay with Unix, well, maybe we'd all be running Unix on our machines and nobody would talk about Windows. So this is just an overview. If you want to get a complete picture uh, at the 11S site here, you can get lots of information about the Unix history. And as you can see, there are of course many versions today like BSD Unix, Mac OS X, uh, Solaris and so on. And there are also some systems that look like Unix, but they are not derived from Unix. And one of the most important systems that behaves like a typical Unix system, but is not derived from Unix is Linux. So Linux was actually written from scratch by a pretty much bored computer science student not that far away from here, so in, in Finland. Uh, so Linus Torvalds decided in the early 90s like, oh yeah, well, let's try to see if I can write something simple that does some preemptive multitasking because he just bought a brand new 386 computer and he was pretty bored of MS-DOS because he had other computers before that had better software. And uh, there's a posting on Usenet. So Usenet is, well, something like the internet forums of today or maybe Reddit, uh, but more civilized and uh, more organized. And so he announced this like in uh, the early 90s, like, oh, I'm starting a small hobby project. It won't be as big as the GNU system which was providing compilers and tools, but had no operating system kernel. And uh, if you want to take a look, it's on that FTP server. So try and download it. And people actually did it and downloaded Linux and tried it on their PCs. And uh, Linux actually got a lot of criticism for his approach. So one very famous person is Andy Tannenbaum at the University of Amsterdam, the Free University of Amsterdam. 
Uh, he's a well-known operating systems professor and he wrote his own Unix-like operating system in the like uh, 1980s to teach operating systems to his students called Minix. And Minix had a more modern structure of the operating system based on isolating certain parts of the kernel and there was lots of criticism and a long discussion on Usenet. You can still find it on Google Groups if you search for it or uh, yeah, and that's an interesting discussion. Nevertheless, Linux has made it, especially due to the contributions of thousands and thousands of, uh, yeah, well, hobby and professional programmers over the world who thought, oh yeah, I need to improve Linux. We need something like video drivers, a network stack, multiprocessor support, and so on. And so, like more than 25 years later now, you can just download the Linux, you can run it on your PC, on your Raspberry Pi. So this happens when you have well, a blueprint to work on. So Linux was modeled after Unix, but it didn't use any of the code of Unix, which made it easier to give out free because AT&T still tried to retain some rights and earn some money with commercial Unix variants. But I uh, shouldn't talk too much about the history of Unix. I find it's interesting, especially to play around with old Unixes because there's so many emulators out there. So if you're interested in this, we can certainly give you a number of links to dig deeper here. Anyways, what is common between all these Unix systems is that these Unix systems follow certain principles, certain abstractions, and these can be found in all of the Unix systems, no matter if you run a commercial Unix like Solaris, uh, or Mac OS X, or if you run some sort of free open source Unix-like system like Linux, or some Unix-derived free open source systems like NetOpen or FreeBSD. And we're going to talk about what is common to these Unix variants in terms of processes in our lecture today. So Unix processes serve as the primary way to structure things that are currently going on on your computer. We just call these things that are going on activities. These can be your application processes, so the programs you started, you have running at the moment, so your text processor, your compiler, your video player, whatever. But you can also have system processes doing stuff in the background, like uh, network servers for, for example, a web server running in the background, or a server uh, taking care of, of updating file system meta information and so on. And one important thing in Unix that distinguished Unix from very many systems that existed at the same time, so in the early 1970s, was that Unix was enabled to create processes fast and easily. And this was done by introducing a hierarchy of processes. So essentially, uh, when you are running a process, you can generate new processes just using a simple system function. And since we're putting this in a hierarchy, so the process you generate can generate other processes in addition, we're doing it in the style of a family named hierarchy. So we have a parent process, and this parent process can create one or more child processes. And of course, these child processes can have more child processes, so this original parent process would be the grandparent process, so to say. That is not an official term, obviously, of this child process, of the child process. And so these processes form a process hierarchy. So you start with the very first process. So this is a so-called swapper process. Swapper takes care of memory management. This is essentially part of the operating system. Some, operating, some Unix-like operating systems don't have this. And as you see, each process has a so-called process ID or short PID, and this is a unique number. So at one point in time, uh, there no two processes can exist having the same process ID. So the swapper is responsible for allocating memory in the beginning, and it's also allocating for uh, responsible for, yeah, saving main memory to disk and reading things from disk to main memory if you need more main memory uh, or load or start new programs. And the swapper process also starts a process which is common in all Unixes and this is the init process. So init is the very first process you actually see running and this init process is responsible for starting up the rest of the system. So what it does is it reads a list of so-called terminals from a special file in the file system called init tab. 
which resides in our directory etc. We've seen our file system hierarchy in the previous lecture. And for each of these terminals, it starts a special process called getty. So getty is just short for get something from a tty. This is ancient. Uh, yeah, an ancient term stands for teletype. So a teletype is this sort of printing terminal that you've seen on the PDP-11 picture like two slides ago. Uh, nowadays, of course, we don't have printing terminals anymore. We have maybe physical terminals, but these are also ancient, like screens and keyboards connected using a serial line to a big computer. Nowadays, your terminals are usually just part of your graphical user interface screen, so they, that's why they're called a terminal emulator, because they behave like a regular terminal. But back in the original times, you had one PDP-11 computer, and then each of the researchers had one of these terminals connected using a long serial cable to the PDP-11 that sat somewhere in the basement in a machine room. So for each of these terminals, when your Unix system was booted, this init process had the information which terminals are connected to which interfaces in the init tab, because the same interfaces were also used for example printers where you can't log in because it's just a printer and for each of the terminals it would spawn this getty process so getty is responsible for putting up a prompt that you also see when you boot linux in text mode and this is the login prompt so getty actually starts a log login process so getty checks if a terminal is connected and if a terminal is connected to this line for example we have the line tty0 here which is one of the, maybe the serial interfaces to your machine. Then it starts login. Login requests your username and password, checks against the password database in Unix if you are a valid user and if you have entered a valid password. And if you have done this, it starts your first user process, which is a shell. So a shell is a command line interpreter, like command com in DOS. You also have the same thing in Unix, but it's called a shell. And one of the most uh, popular shells nowadays in Linux is the so-called bash. So bash, sh, is always for shell. So any Unix program ending in sh is usually a shell. So there are other shells like C shells, CSH, or corn shell, built by a, a researcher called uh, David Korn, I think. And there's also a, a shell called fish, F-I-S-H, because, yeah, well, I think the inventors would, wanted to have some fun with the name. So bash stands for born again shell. So uh, yeah, that's a bit strange because the shells, well, they die as a process, but of course they don't, don't die as a product. So that is a bit of a typical Unix style nerd joke, I'd say. So Steve Born was a researcher at Bell Lab who wrote one of the most used Unix shells in the 1970s for 7th edition Unix. And this was called the Born shell with an O-U. So Steve Born. And uh, since the people writing software for the GNU project, so this started with Richard Stallman, you probably heard about him, uh, wanted to reproduce a Unix environment on uh, whatever systems they had, which was free to use and open source because Unix was not open source back then. Uh, they just wrote, yeah, identically functioning versions of all the Unix tools, including the shell. And so they looked of the specifications in the man pages for the Unix shell found it was a born shell. And since they were redoing the shell, now it, uh, it is the born again shell. Yes, that's a pretty bad pun, but it has survived for the last 20 or so years. And this shell is your basic mode of interaction with a text-based Unix system. So of course, in a graphical-based Unix system. So if you have a graphical user interface like an X11 system or a, a Mac, uh, running its own Windows system. You obviously have different ways of interacting, but then still you can open a terminal window. This opens a shell for you and you can enter commands. And the commands you enter are also just Unix processes. So the shell is enabled also to start Unix processes as a child. So I could start a Firefox web browser or I can start a command line program that searches for some text in a file. So the shell just uses processes like all the other processes and this builds up our process hierarchy. So our system when our kernel boots first creates this swapper process and this swapper process creates two child process that run, processes that run all the time in uh, Unix. One is the init process. This is responsible for starting all the getties on the terminals. One is the page daemon responsible for managing swapping in and out of memory and then each Getty process can start a login, 
and when you successfully have logged in, then you can execute the commands you want on your Unix system. So a Unix shell yeah, is something like a shell around the core of the operating system. So it's a text-based user interface to start commands, and commands are simply programs in Unix, and these programs can be programs compiled to binary code, but you can also have programs written in a scripting language. For example, you can write scripts in your shell, so the shell understands some sort of simple command language. These are called shell scripts. And these commands can be located anywhere in the file system of your Unix machine. And when you type the name of a command, so like grep or Firefox, the shell searches in a set of directories and you configure the set of directories in a so-called environment variable called $pass. So all of the environment variables, if you want to get to the content, you have to add a dollar in front of it. Maybe it's easy to remember because you get the value of that variable. So it's a dollar which has some value you put in front of it. So a typical content of this environment variable would start like this. You have user bin, so these are binaries in the user directory. You have slash bin, which are system binary programs. And then you can have something which are installed locally on your machine in user local bin, and so on and so forth. So this can contain many more directories. And if you type the name of a command in Unix, the shell actually goes through all these directories and tries to see, can I find this command in this directory? And the first yeah, match it has, so for example, we find our command we typed in slash bin, this is then started and executed. So when you ent interact with a shell, you see something like this on the left-hand side automatically configured. This is con the configurable prompt, and this prompt just tells you Okay, the shell is ready to receive a command from the keyboard. This is usually indicated by a special character like this uh, angled bracket here. And you can put some in interesting information in front of it. So for example, your username, so that's me, uh, your computer name. So if you have several computers you can be logged into, you know which machine you're logged onto so you don't delete a file on the wrong machine. And then you can, for example, also print the directory your shell is currently in. So you're always somewhere in your file system hierarchy when you use the shell. Usually you start in your home directory and your home directory is abbreviated with this tilde character here, so this wiggly line. And if you change a directory using the cd command for change directory, well then your prompt would also change. So this is essentially a primitive shell script that runs every time when a new command can be entered. And then you can enter a command like the uh, yeah, line shown here in blue. So this is your input. And for example, you can enter the command which, and which gets a parameter vim. So which is a Unix command. This is actually not a command you find in your file system. This is functionality built into the shell. And which just looks through your environment pass uh, variable here to see where is the program you give as a parameter locator? So which, and then a program name for WIM, for example, is a uh, one of the common editors on the Unix system, and it tells you where this WIM editor can be found. So for example, in most systems, which WIM would return its in user bin, because that would be the standard location to install WIM to. So uh, usually, if you execute a command on the Unix command line in a shell, these executed commands are executed as a separate child process. So the shell doesn't just execute the program as part of itself because a shell is made to execute arbitrary many programs. It can't compile in all the functionality of a shell. So essentially it needs to find the program or command to be executed on disk in your file system and then it creates a so-called child process as we've seen before. So the shell continues running, it's not stopped or something because you want to stay in the same context. It creates a child process, this child process then takes over your terminal and the shell usually waits until the last command you gave is terminated. So either it terminates successfully, so your program is finished or it might run into some error and then it is terminated. But it's also possible to suspend a job. So if you started a long running program, for example, a program that calculates the prime numbers between one and one million, and you're sitting at a terminal and you figure out, oh, you urgently need to send an email. 
then you can suspend this program calculating your prime numbers uh, and then you can uh, uh, run another program like checking your mails in between you can continue the uh, prime number calculation program afterwards when you finish writing your email you can also terminate commands so you can uh, cancel or well, in unix terminology it's called kill a running command if it's running too long or if you figured out it's doing the wrong thing and you can also have commands running in the background so if you started your prime number program you can just suspend it and then you can tell this program continue running in the background because i have other important things to do now on a modern unix system with a graphical user interface of course it would be easier in many cases to just open another terminal window and use your commands from there but back then in the early times you only had one terminal such a terminal cost back then between a thousand and two thousand dollars each so just for a stupid screen and keyboard with a serial interface uh, so usually you were given multiple terminals and uh, those were pretty big so multiple terminals usually didn't fit on your uh, on your desk so essentially job control was very useful for yeah human multitasking so if you were starting something and you decided you needed to do something else in between so if you're employing job control you can use very special characters here and this is what the control key on your keyboard is for to exert control over what's going on so you probably all know control c as a shortcut or, or a key combination to terminate a program so c for cancel and uh, if you want to put a program in the background then there's just another key combination you can use and this is control and z so if you start a program like the vim editor and you want to edit uh, a program called uh, vim uh, a program source code called foo.c then the command uh, sorry vim is started obviously and not which and the shell blocks so you have vim in the foreground and the shell just waits until vim would be completed so you saved your file you exited the editor but when you're running the editor and press ctrl z then vim is suspended so it's not killed it's kept in memory it's kept as a process but control is returned to the shell so you get an output like oh there's one process in the background this is now stopped so it's suspended and this process was vim and it had a parameter foo.c and now you have your shell prompt back so you can do something else vim is just in the background it can't do anything so you can maybe call another editor here this would be a graphical editor called kate and you can start it with a parameter bar.c so you want to edit another file bar.c and now you can do something else you can add this and character here so-called ampersand character at the end of the line and this is a special character telling your unix shell not only start this program but immediately put it in the background and if you have a process running in the background this is not suspended but it can run as a parallel process remember we have concurrent processes uh, and you can continue using your shell so if you now run your a command called jobs this indicates which jobs are currently running in your current shell and you see you have a stop process this was your vim process which we suspended using ctrl z and you have a program running in the background a process which is number two here which is your kate command which was automatically put in the background because you added this and character here so how can this work with an editor well uh, that is automatically running in the background because then it cannot receive any key presses or something now kate on linux would be an editor using a graphical user interface i think this is one of the editors coming with the kde window system so kate is an editor that opens its own window independent of the shell so if you change your focus using your mouse to the kate window the kate window receives the keyboard input if you change it back to your terminal window your terminal window gets the input now we still have this suspended vim process here and if you wanted to suspend your process and you want to put it in the background then you can use a bg command and bg gets a parameter that refers to the number of the process in your jobs listing so bg percent one means please put this process in our list number one here so this is not a process id but just a list id in the background so vim would also now continue running in the background 
It couldn't really do any useful things there because it can't receive any key presses, but we can nevertheless do this. So essentially when you run jobs again, you see Wim is now running in the background and Kate is also running in the background. So your shell has two child processes here, uh, which are both running in the background, obviously. So this is sort of what you can do a small part of what you can do with Unix jobs. So as a user sitting in front of a terminal, you have lots of control over what your processes do. So you don't need to, to do any very special things in order to terminate processes or to put them from the foreground to the background or even back. So usually programs operate on some data. So this data has to be provided two programs in a, a more or less standard way in order to make programming easier for somebody using the system. And usually each process can get input and output. Input usually is from a keyboard. Output usually is to a screen or a terminal window, obviously on modern systems. And so a typical Unix process is provided with IO channels. So these IO channels are just queues in which characters are input on one end from the keyboard, for example, and they end up uh, so that you can read them as input characters in your application or the other way around. You output characters and these eventually appear on your screen. So you have two channels for so-called standard input. So this is the input that is usually coming from your keyboard. So standard input is a channel that goes from your keyboard and delivers characters to your process. And if you want to output characters or text, you use the standard output. This is a channel which goes from your process and delivers characters to your terminal. Now in Unix, there's also another channel, which is also an output channel, and this is the standard error channel. So you also see the abbreviations here, standard in, standard out, and standard error. And standard error is a separate channel just for displaying error messages. So when you write a program, you can have standard program output like you have your prime number program that outputs the prime numbers. And if some error shows up while you execute your program, you want to ensure it's not intermixed with your standard output of your prime numbers, but it can be separated. And this is why there is a separate error standard output channel, uh, because this standard error channel then is can only be used or can be used only to output error messages and if you keep to this, so if you put your regular output on standard output and the error output on standard error, like you're running out of memory or something like this, uh, then you can separate them. Now usually on Unix, standard out and standard error are both redirected to the terminal. So uh, in a standard configured system, you'd see uh, the uh, output of your program on standard out and the error messages interspersed on your terminal but there's ways to separate them and we'll take a look at some simple ways to do this in a bit. So almost all Unix commands, now all Unix commands, re, uh, yeah, actually support these standard IO channels, but almost all Unix commands also accept files as input or output channels. So for example, when we use our editor, we don't need to set up such an input and output channel, but we can just say, editor, please edit our file foo.c so we can give a parameter to our, for example, Wim editor in order to tell it, please use this file. So shells provide a simple syntax to redirect these channels. So what Unix wanted to do is it wanted to make these programming tasks very simple by providing small programs that were doing well-defined things. And then you could actually have these programs work together. So the output of one program would become the input of another program and so you could build more complex programs out of simple ones. And this is how you do it. So to redirect input and output on the shell, you use uh, the uh, yeah, left and right angled brackets here as we see. So you type a command name. Here the first command would be ls. So ls is a Unix command for listing the contents of a directory. So Unix programs are lazy, so they try to abbreviate everything. ls gets a parameter dash l. So dash l in, uh, indicates to L ls, please give me a long output. So not only the file names in my current directory, but also the modification date, the size and the access rights. And usually when you type ls dash l on the command line, 
the contents of your current directory are printed on your screen. So if you want to have the contents of your current directory not printed on the screen, but contained in a directory uh, in a file, and let's call this file d1, you would redirect the standard output. So ls.l uh, is not changed in any way, just its output channel is no longer connected to the terminal, but the characters ls-l outputs on its standard output are instead written into a file d1. So this is functionality the shell provides. So essentially ls doesn't have to be changed to implement this functionality to output something to a file instead of the screen, which is nice. And then if you have a file, you can operate on this. For example, grep is a typical Unix command to search for strings or patterns inside of uh, yeah, a, a file or a standard input. Now grep can read from the keyboard. So you can just type grep and then in double quotes gen29 to search for a date, for example, in a file. And then you can type on the keyboard and uh, well, it would just give you all the lines that contains gen29. Uh, but of course, that's not very useful. You want to grab through files. So what you can do is you can redirect the standard input of grab to read from D1. This is the left pointing angled bracket here. So instead of reading from the keyboard, grab reads from this file D1, which we just generated as the output of ls-l. And we want the output of grab not to go to the terminal, but to another file D2. So we again use output re redirection here to output all the matching lines in our file that contains the text gen, a space and 2.9 to a new file called d2. And then maybe we want to count the words in d2. So how many words, how many lines actually match d2. So we call the wc for word count command and word count without any parameter would also just read from the keyboard. And so we tell it, please use this input redirection. The shell redirects the input to read from our D2 file that we just generated as output of our grep command. And then WSC gives the output as the number of matching lines, number of matching characters in your file that was provided, yeah, redirected on the standard output. So originally on D2. So we have two important redirections. We can redirect the standard output using the angled right bracket. We can redirect the standard input to a command using the angled left bracket. And uh, there's also a way to redirect the standard error channel. We're not showing this here, uh, but we can show this later. Now, the problem with this is you're only interested maybe in the output. So you want to have the listing of your files and you want to know how many of these files were uh, modified on, 20, on the 29th of January. So after these three commands, you have two temporary files lying in your file system. So you'd have to clean up D1 and D2. And can there be a better way to actually just join these programs together instead of yeah, creating temporary files, which you have to clean up later? And yes, Unix provides a way for, uh, to do this. So this is also implemented by the shell. So you can create something that's called a shell pipeline. Pipeline just means it's, yeah, you can imagine there's a, a network of pipes, for example, water supply or something. And so the output of one element, so of one process you started, its standard output goes through that pipe and that pipe can store a number of characters, for example. And then the output of that pipe is connected to your next process, which might be the grep process. And to indicate that this is a pipeline, it's drawn or it's indicated using this pipe character. So the vertical bar uh, that you can find on your keyboard. So that's a visual indication. Yes, this is a pipeline. Uh, so you can connect the standard output of ls to the standard input uh, of grep by just writing the commands one after the other and combining them using the pipe character. So all the output of ls-l goes to the standard input of grep and the standard output of grep then immediately goes to our word count command and then the word count output is not redirected anywhere. So this goes to your terminal. So this is very important. So you have programs doing very simple things. So you don't have to extend your ls program, for example, to list or to get a parameter oh, please list only files of a specific date, but you use 
yeah, very simple text processing commands to actually filter these texts. So essentially, ls-l gives you all of the files as the output in your current directory. Then grep throws away all of the lines which are not containing gen29 as a text. And then only the lines containing this text are output on standard output here. And this is then passed to the wc command. So we don't have any intermediate files anymore. So these things are buffered internally in the operating system. And your shell takes care when you enter a command line consisting of pipes to connect the standard output of ls to the standard input of grep and in turn to connect the standard output of grep to the standard input of our word count command. So this is a very powerful method because then you can restrict yourself to writing very simple commands. And if you have a large set of these simple commands, you're free to combine them in any way you like to create more complex functionality. So this is part of the Unix philosophy. So one of the uh, Unix researchers is Doug McIlroy, and he is the inventor of Unix pipes. And he summarized the Unix philosophy as follows. So Unix is intended to have programs that just do one thing and they do it well. So without errors and efficiently. So an ls command, for example, should only output the contents of a directory. Then you want programs to work together. So you have methods to yeah, connect them, so to have them cooperate. So essentially like the pipes we've seen before. And the question is, of course, which data is flowing through these pipes. And of course, if you would just pass graphics through these pipes, this might be more difficult to handle. So uh, all the stuff that's uh, flowing through these pipes is actually a text stream. So these are printable characters in the usual case. So the output of S is just characters that would usually be outputted on the screen. And these are now, if you redirect them, going to the input of another program. So Unix is very big on all of this text processing. Text is a universal interface here. And so what is flowing over these pipelines is usually text. You're not restricted to do text. But if you have programs that ex expect text and generate text again, then it's very easy to join them up because what they produce is the same that what they expect. And we can commonly express this in a shorter way. So if you write a program, write a program to do one thing and do it well. And if you need more functionality, think about how you can structure your problem into smaller parts. And then maybe some of these smaller parts are already solved by programs existing on your Unix system.